Hi, um, my name's uh, Angel Martinez um, Sanchez. Um, I am a distributed systems en enthusiast. Um, the, the, uh, quick disclaimer, um, I know there's a, uh, this is a different title. There were two parts to this talk. Um, uh, the first part uh, is checked, good to go. Uh, uh, we're we're going to be talking about data systems uh, like databases, caches, materialized views, and their relation to both developers and consumers. Um, the different types of data systems like homogeneous systems and when a developer might want to have to move on over to a heterogeneous system. Um, we're going to talk about dealing with growth and scale with both developers and consumers, issues that come with growth, and then proposing solutions with OTP. Um, so the first part one is very um, system architecture. Uh, part two of this talk was supposed to be us looking at practical examples of set solutions in, with Broadway, Flow, and GenStage. Um, but I was not able to uh, finish the proof of concept uh, in time. Um, so um, instead, um, we'll be, we will be talking about uh, um, things, like, uh, things like Broadway and their possibilities and at the architecture level. Um, but I, I did want to lay that out. Um, so, um, Um, okay, so the full disclaimer, I, <coughs> I, I, I helped a friend start a company about four years ago. We, our first system was built in React, uh, Node.js, MongoDB, purely JavaScript because we thought, hey, it's JavaScript. I mean, we can do everything in JavaScript. It lessens uh, the learning curve um, and the amount of stuff we had to do. <laughs> and when we reached a certain uh, point of, uh, in, an inflection point, um, we finally figured out how wrong we, uh, we, we got things. <laughs> um, we spent several months, a couple of years, moving our users to a Postgres uh, Rails application, but learning, but uh, building the plane as we flew it re uh, really had its costs. Uh, as I was interviewing, I interviewed over the summer, I interviewed in May for a few lo senior level positions. And the number one thing they asked about was um, experience with scale. So I spent the summer uh, re researching how to design data intensive applications. Uh, one of them, um, one of uh, my key points of study being uh, the book Designing Data Intensive Applications by Martin uh, Klotman. 
And this is kind of a summary of <laughs> a summer's worth of learning. And I say that to ask that you take everything I say with a big grain of salt. Um, Okay, so when building an application, uh, most devs start with a homogeneous system. Uh, an example being uh, kind of example being uh, Phoenix developers will use Ecto to manage Postgres. One second, sorry. Thank you. Uh, my notes are not syncing up. Um, can I borrow your computer? Yeah. Cool. Let me disconnect real quick. So, um, So uh, an example of a homogeneous, homogeneous system where everything's the same. An ex uh, a dev might use a Phoenix, Phoenix app with an Elixir database manager and maybe some other Elixir tools like Oban to build business logic. It's rare that from the beginning, and it's, rare, it's really rare from the beginning that an engineer will say, we need to support MongoDB, Postgres, and Snowflake for analytics. As a company grows, different data systems might be needed to handle set growth. Set growth. Some systems that might not have been needed before, <laughs> before set growth. Set growth. Um, uh, when I first started at DevDuo, we built our first app. Um, uh, like I said, uh, we built our first app and entirely in, in React, JavaScript, um, and before moving over to um, Ruby on Rails with Postgres, that migration did create, um, that migration took, uh, was a nightmare that took months to happen. But, uh, but what if we could, uh, what would, if we had unbundled our databases and uh, we composed our data storage techniques, um, designing applications around data flow and absorbing derived state. Uh, what if we had found our way to unify our rights? What if we built a pipeline that sent some data to both MongoDB and Postgres, letting us slowly take out MongoDB? What if we wanted to add an OLAP analytics database like Snowflake, but without having to build an app interface for it? Uh, there is strength in diversification. Every technology has things that it's su suited for. It's special strengths and things that it's not suited for. Okay, let me set this scene. Uh, this scene. Um, we have a Phoenix app, a React app, and a Django app. And we will be using um, an event store. So requests from an app are sent to are sent as immutable messages to a log of events. Um, the log of events will act as a producer of raw data for uh, a Broadway batching pipeline. Uh, the batching Broadway pipeline will extract 
slash consume those events and transform them into Luxor structures that can be loaded into the appropriate databases, whether that be MongoDB, Postgres, or Snowflake. Uh, those databases will then create uh, data systems, uh, their own data systems uh, from derived data, like, um, I don't know if this, that's, Um, these databases can then create their own data systems like um, materialized views, um, app caches, or uh, possibly search indexes. So you could have a Python tool that um, only needs to get to your Postgres or a React app that needs to hit both uh, MongoDB and Snowflakes for future analytics, or an Elixir app that can hit all three for whatever reason. Um. Uh, then, uh, then your apps could, uh, for example, like your Phoenix app could read uh, straight from those materialized views. And this increases uh, fault tolerance, because if any of your data systems ever went down, you have an immutable, uh, you have an event store that, that had been written, writing all of your actions as immutable objects, lock, uh, lock of events. So everything we've, we're talking about right now is with the assumption that, we, um, that we're working on one machine. Uh, then you have to decide if you want to open up uh, Pandora's box and do distributed systems. Um, why <laughs> um, the reason one wa might want to do distributed systems, um, which is uh, having um, Many nodes ser uh, servers act as one. Uh, maybe, you're, uh, maybe you go from being a regional company to a global one. Now you have uh, to account for latency. Maybe you have go from a few thousand requests to a few million. Um, Um, what worked for 1,000 users around Kentucky, which was our demographic, won't work for 100,000 users spread across Kentucky, Dallas, LA, Paris, France, and Australia. Uh, for the best user experience, you want your app as close to the user as possible, and you want to have the most bandwidth available to them. Uh, the simplest method of doing this um, is single leader replication. Um, and as a quick recap, uh, users connect to a data center to read data from. Anytime a user in Washington wants to make a write, it has to give it to the leader wherever they may be so that the leader can tell everyone else. Uh, the more traffic you get, the more your leader gets bogged down because it has to write each request in synchronous order. Uh, the further away your users are to that leader, uh, the bigger the latency is. Uh, single leader distributed systems are hard because you need all replicas to know the same things all at once. Um, so this next part is, uh, uh, again, I took the summer to read this. And um, so th uh, the next part is what I advise the biggest grain of salt. Um, um, so, um, so what we have here is a synchronous, uh, uh, a synchronous system where 
every request has to be written down in a synchronous order, so um, there's no data, there's no integrity corruption. Um, So what can we do? Um, um, for starters, uh, we could have um, um, at the request level, at the Postgres level, you could, we could add a request ID to each request. Um, um, that, that way when a user makes a request and for some reason like a loss of connection, they don't hear back, instead of the user making that request again, um, the system can suppress the duplicate and reduce the amount of traffic going to the leader. Um, Next, we could separate uh, our rights between those that have loose constraints and those that ha have strict, unique constraints. Um, one way to put this is uh, loose constraints are errors where that can be apologized for and strict, unique constraints um, are errors that would be too expensive to recover from. Um, this, is a, this is a dumb example, but let's say you have uh, 13 users commenting on your, a blog post. Uh, it doesn't matter when every user sees those posts. Um, you don't have to worry about So the basic idea was you would split your, um, you would split the rights between those you could afford to apologize for and those that you couldn't. Uh, so weak constraints versus strong constraints. Um, unique constraints like uh, usernames um, require consensus around the system. So they require every right to go through the leader. But if you, had, if you had a section of your app as loose constraints uh, that could be apologized for, you could, every data center could act as its own leader, accepting uh, asynchronous rights. And then at a certain point in time, you could have one batch system to, to correct the data and preserve in, in, integrity. And if any of those loose constraints are violated, um, it wouldn't be that big of an issue. Un, and as the benefit, you get asynchronous requests, uh, you get data, data center decoupling, and um, Geographically, uh, uh, latency decreases because a user in Australia can make loose um, can make uh, rights to the to the leader in Australia instead of having to talk to uh, the leader in uh, Virginia. If uh, one of the leaders were to go down, uh, the Australia data center could still process uh, rights that were labeled as uh, loose constraints and then be corrected at a certain point in time, at a later point in time to preserve data integrity. Um.
Um, so I wanted to build um, an end-to-end -end solution. I thought Phoenix had the best tooling um, with OTP, uh, Flow, Broadway. Um, we're, uh, we're very good at uh, taking architecture tool level tools and bringing them down to the application part and large part to RTP. Um, uh, again, going back to this, um, the, the solution I had was to have users submit raw data via the Django, Phoenix, or React applications and an interface store, uh, application interface to an event store that I will have Broadway batching in between the event store and the databases. Broadway would extract the data, transform the data inputs, and load it into each specified, uh, into each da uh, specified database, uh, possibly all three. Um, uh, that would create the materialized views or um, app caches for applications to read from. Um, so this, <laughs> this is kind of what I learned over the summer scratched the surface of and what I wanted to present. Um, I, I, my first pitch to the committee got rejected and I, I got off the wait list uh, two weeks ago. And that's, I now realize I wasn't enough time. But I, I, I hope you guys, uh, you all got uh, something from it. Uh, if anything that you really need more than two weeks to prepare a presentation. Um, I have some resources. Um, Uh, again, designing data intensive applications with Martin Kleppman, uh, the biggest inspiration behind this. Uh, event sourcing with Elixir by Peter Ulrich. Um, events, event sourcing and CQRS in Elixir. Uh, I forget which one was this. I think, I think this was by V. Uh, thinking in events from databases to distributed collaboration software. Um, there was this one company in Mexico that had an art, at a very cool architecture and production uh, that wasn't, uh, wasn't open sourced. Um, it did use uh, uh, CACA events through Broadway processing through uh, Commandit uh, to eventually create an aggregator and uh, events. Um, uh, it, that's the last one. Um, I'll, let me, Um, I'll be tweeting this out later at uh, my Twitter, that's uh, Sir AMC. <laughs> uh, editing slides in the middle of a uh, presentation, is that, is that a first? <laughs> do it, let's do it live. Uh, so um, thank you, and I, I don't think I'm qualified to uh, take questions, but if you guys want to discuss, talk about this later, I'm free and open. <laughs>